Switzerland is home to luxury items, the best quality watches in the world. But another thing peculiar to Switzerland is Chevrolet. Camaro, at your Chevrolet dealers now. Chevrolet is a household name in the automotive industry and the world entirely. However, behind the brand's success is a sad story not so many people know. The automobile brand Chevrolet got its name from Louis Joseph Chevrolet, a car racer, also a co-founder of Chevrolet Car Company in 1911. Louis Chevrolet was born on December 25, 1887 to Joseph Felician Chevrolet and Marie Anne Angeline Mann. Chevrolet was born in Le Chaux de Fonds, northwestern Switzerland. Later on, the family moved to Bonne, France, when Louis was around nine. His father continued his watchmaking job, and Louis would always follow him to the shop. Unfortunately, the business didn't thrive as expected, making Louis start working at 11. Louis was a sucker for speed and the latest technology at the time, hence his choice to work in a bicycle shop. He didn't only learn the mechanical aspects of bicycles, he learned how to ride them. He was so keen on bicycles that he later learned how to race, leading to his first ever car race victory recorded by Journal de Bone on July 9, 1895. While working at Bone, he had an epiphany, and at that point, he realized he wanted more. One day, he was sent to a local hotel to assist with some technical work when he came across a self-propelled car a steam tricycle whose owner was the American multimillionaire Vanderbilt. But there was one customer who left a lasting impression on me. He was so swift with fixing the tricycle, greatly impressing Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt suggested that his talent would be a great deal in the United States. That day would eventually come to be Chevrolet's unforgettable experience. While he lived in Paris, he worked at various mechanics workshops between 1899 and 1900 and saved up money to move to Canada later in 1900. Louis's life was flanked by itinerary. Again, he moved to New York City, working for a Swiss immigrant, then switched over to French car manufacturer de Dion Bouton. Louis's early years in America saw him working majorly for dealerships of European automakers. His prior knowledge about cars put him in a good position at the time. If you are familiar with those periods, you would understand no other form of advertisement beats car racing adverts. So, due to his knowledge of car racing, Louis Chevrolet did some racing ads. At some point, he became a driver for his employers. He explores racing as well, which he was successful at. Louis set a new world record when he won the three miles race. Moving forward, Louis and his brothers, Arthur and Gaston, would later participate in car races and eventually they formed a team under the leadership of Louis. Louis Chevrolet successfully penetrated the car racing world. He was so skilled that he earned the title, the Daredevil Frenchman. However, he had to bear the downside of racing he had a series of accidents, and he had to spend a lot of time in the hospital. In 1905, during the Vanderbilt Cup race, he lost control and flew off the track, sustaining degrees of injuries. Later, in 1909, he raced at the infamous Giant Despair Hill Climb. In a short period, the name Louis Chevrolet rang a bell across countries. His victory at racing brought him to the notice of William Durant, the owner of Buick and founder of General Motors. Louis and William Durant became acquainted. Louis began to work for William Durant, where he learned more about cars and designing in Buick. With no formal education, Louis got equipped with the knowledge of car designing, all thanks to William Durant. In 1909, Louis started designing his own engine for a new car. He landed recognition as one of the three co-designers of the Buick 60 Special, also known as the Buick Bug. He later built an overhead valve six-cylinder engine at his machine shop on Grand River Boulevard, Detroit, Michigan. On November 3, 1911, 
Louis co-founded Chevrolet alongside his brother Arthur, William Durant, and Dr. Edwin Campbell under Chevrolet Motor Car Company, Detroit. About a year after the establishment of Chevrolet, the first six engines were released into the market and then followed by the four-cylinder Baby Grand, the two-seater Royal Mail, and a light 6L series. It is worthy of note that Chevrolet doubled as a co-founder and car designer. All these were during the years when Ford dominated the scene, so infiltrating the automotive industry didn't come easy for Chevrolet. Ford was a great contender against the success of Chevrolet. For that reason, the businessman William Durant decided to make Chevrolet affordable. Fortunately for Durant and unfortunately for Chevrolet, Ford had issues with Chevrolet over their designs. In 1915, Durant did the unthinkable. He sold his share of the cars for a cheaper amount, then started McLaughlin's company in Canada to build Chevrolets. Louis and Durant also had their difference, and at one of their differences was rooted in how Louis smoked and kept cheap cigarettes in the corner of his mouth. Durant didn't like that. He told Louis to at least upgrade from cheap cigarettes, but he turned him down vehemently, claiming that he sold his cars and designed to Durant and never will he sell his personality. Louis was very pissed, left the company, and never returned. Here is the sad part. Unknown to Louis, Durant was a notorious businessman that was kicked out of General Motors. He planned to use Louis as an instrument of revenge, which he succeeded in. He knew Louis wasn't formally educated, which was the loophole he needed. He had already stolen a design from General Motors before their fallout, and that was part of what he made Louis use for their new creation. While Louis was about creating unique luxury cars, Durant wanted to be rich to take revenge on his former employer. The Classic 6 was an exotic car from the wings of Chevrolet. It was a car of class and affluent, beating Henry Ford at his own game. The fact that the car was a luxury car made it unaffordable for most people, and this pissed off Durant, who was only concerned about making a profit. There was a wide market margin between Chevrolet's Classic 6 and Ford's Model T. The former costs $2,150, while the latter costs less than $600. Not to forget that there are other competitions around. Who wants to pay that much for a car when there are cheaper alternatives? Durant would always blame Louis for their predicament as they didn't make as much profit as those that sell affordable vehicles. Durant would always talk down on Louis in front of their staff, constantly accusing him of poisoning them with smoke from his cheap cigarettes. Durant stopped at nothing to humiliate Louis and made him feel like a crude European guy who doesn't belong in the Polish world of automotive, neglecting that the company wouldn't have seen the light of day without Louis. Following Louis's absence in 1913, Durant shifted to selling cars at cheap rates. He launched a new business but retained the name Chevrolet. The company churned out affordable cars with a push better than Ford's. In no time, Durant found his footing and went back to General Motors, where he was initially ousted, buying a controlling stake in the company as revenge on the shareholders he once worked with. After terminating his relationship with Durant, Chevrolet sold his shares due to his resentment towards Durant. Afterward, he returned to car racing. He also joined the Blood Brothers machine company's Howard Blood, and they both created a brand new Cornelia racing car with less than a hundred examples. The Cornelia would become the first ever chain propelled that ever won in a race car. In 1916, Louis and his younger brothers, Gaston and Arthur, established Frontenac Motor Corporation, making racing parts for Ford's Model Ts. Producing racing parts then was very successful, and in no time, they were popular for the front Ford racers, among other things. That same year, American Motors was created in New Jersey, where Louis served as president and chief engineer. His interest in racing continued by the side, and in 1919, 
He raced in the Indianapolis 500 four times, finishing in seventh place consecutively. In the subsequent years, Louis and Gaston competed alongside the Sunbeams coming in third place, respectively. Arthur competed twice, but Gaston eventually won the race driving one of their Frontenacs in 1920. Unfortunately, however, during one of the races, Gaston lost control, crashing his car, leading to his death. Gaston's death badly hit Louis so much that he quit racing. Well, he did race years later, but it was not enough to bring back his glory days. Louis returned to work at the Frontenac, but not for long. The business didn't succeed. Life was unfair to Louis, so he went back to General Motors, a company that he co-founded, to work as a minimum wage mechanic. Like that wasn't enough, atherosclerosis, the disease of racers, made life unbearable for him. He moved to Florida with his wife at the time, and the weather made his condition worse, leading to the amputation of his leg. Life continued to deal him hard blows. On June 6, 1941, Louis Chevrolet sadly passed away in Detroit. Louis neither left a legacy nor a fortune, but a sad story for generations to come. The Chevrolet car brand still thrives in the automotive industry till now, with not so many people aware of its real history. Safe to say, without Louis Chevrolet, there wouldn't be Chevrolet. That's all for today, guys. You can drop your comments in the comment section. Don't forget to like this video and smash on the bell icon to subscribe to this channel.